Okay, should we, should we get started? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's um, let's get started. Uh, thank you, thank you, thanks everyone for, for being here today with us. Um, today's talk is about Ceph and uh, and OpenStack. Uh, my name is Sebastian and I work for Red Hat. Uh, I joined Red Hat from the Eleven's acquisition last year. I'm a senior cloud architect at Red Hat now. Uh, my two domain of expertise are Ceph and OpenStack. And uh, apart from this, I always devote a, a third part of my time to, uh, to blogging. So here's a little bit of uh, self-promotion. Well, uh, yeah, Josh. Um, I'm, my name is Josh Durgan. I'm the RBD uh, lead developer. Um, I'm with Red Hat now. I was part of Big Tank and DreamWorks before that. I'm working on stuff since I graduated college. Um, Sebastian, okay. tell us a little bit what we're going to do today. Okay, awesome. So today's agenda, uh, for, for those of you who are not really familiar with Ceph, we're going to spend uh, a little bit of time uh, explaining what is Ceph, what, what it does, uh, how it works, and uh, why it's so cool. Um, then, um, what Josh is going to do that, then I'll be explaining what, uh, what happened during this uh, kilo cycle, what's our roadmap for liberty, and, uh, and beyond that too. Then uh, Josh is going to jump into what's happened, uh, what happened into the last Ceph release, and we will go a little bit on the roadmap of Ceph as well too. So, what happened in Hammer? Louder? Oh, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, so yeah, we're gonna we're gonna go through what happened into uh, Hammer, and we uh, we're gonna give you a little bit of the roadmap for Infernalis, and now and then we will finish with uh, get the best cloud configuration. So. We will basically go through all the components of OpenStack and explain you why you should configure them that way to, uh, to, to be connected to, to Ceph. So, yeah, Josh. So what is Ceph? Well, Ceph is a software-defined storage system that's uh, open, all open source, designed for highly scalable operation, um, and designed to run on any kind of hardware you have. That's basically a, um, a couple sentence summary. Um, the main components of Ceph are all built on top of a low-level object store called Rados. And on top of Rados, we have three different in interfaces that you can expose data uh, storage. Rados handles all the low-level details of replication and consistency um, for you so that um, building higher-level components like a block device or an object store um, is much e easier. So three main components on top of Rados are the Rados Gateway, which provides an S3 or Swift-like interface, um, RBD, which provides a block device for virtual machines or for um, other workloads, and a file system called CephFS, which, which is uh, the only component that is not completely stable yet. So what, how does Ceph integrate with OpenStack? Well, it integrates with a number of services. Um, at the ba most basic level, Cinder, Glance, and uh, Nova all consume storage, and they can all be backed by RBD. Um, for a long time now, um, since uh, RBD has supported thin provisioning and cloning, You've been able to do copy and write clones from images stored in Glance on RBD to uh, Cinder volumes or Nova ephemeral disks. The Rados Gateway, providing a Swift interface, um, integrates with Keystone, so it can uh, use Keystone for authentication. And uh, more recently, there's um, also Splometer in the, entering the picture later. We'll talk about. Okay, so uh, what happened in uh, in Kilo, and what's what going to happen in Liberty and Beyond? So, well, to be really honest, uh, this uh, this cycle was uh, a little bit disappointing because we uh, we didn't get enough time and uh, enough attention as well uh, from, uh, from for the re reviews and things like this to get our patches merged. So, what we started doing is to uh, we partially implemented the RBD snapshots uh, for for QMU uh, because we um, when you snapshot an instance, basically you we use uh, QMU EMG and then it gets locally on the hypervisor and then it's. Uh, streamed into Glance and then uploaded into Ceph, which is extremely so and really inefficient. Um, and then we also have to provision a certain amount of space on your hypervisors to uh, let this, these snapshots happen in too. So what we want here is to use RBD snapshots instead of uh, QMU snapshots. So the way we implemented this now is just uh, at the Glance level. Um, nothing has been merged yet uh, into Nova, unfortunately. We have, uh, it's not directly connected to, uh, to Ceph, but it's something really important that we need, uh, which is the base, uh, base image conversion uh, in Glance. So um, Ceph has the ability to work with several image types, uh, QCard2, RAW, but the main issue with that is uh, it's uh, given that Ceph have 
uh, has multiple capabilities for such as copy and write clones and things like this, things that we already implemented into OpenStack. Uh, if you want to really get advantage of all these features, you really want to use raw images. But uh, the downside of this is that it's really difficult to, to force all of the users to upload raw images. Um, no one wants to upload 20 or 50 gig images and no operator wants, wants to get uh, 150 gig images uh, getting into the clouds. So we had to come up with a way on directly importing, uh, while importing a new image, it's going to be QCow2, and just to, on the fly, uh, convert it into RAW. Uh, so it's just um, the first bit of this, uh, and uh, we're going to continue that work into the, uh, the Liberty cycle. Uh, we, um, we now support DevStack. Uh, well, we have been supporting Ceph DevStack for, uh, for uh, yeah, one release now. And uh, one thing that I had to do, and well, this is mainly why I did it, is just that uh, I had to run several benchmarks on an existing Ceph cluster, and then I wanted to rapidly get a, 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 an, a, an OpenStack environment up and running. So well, what's better to, uh, for this to use DevStack? So now with DevStack, you can, you can simply uh, bootstrap your, uh, your resources with DevStack and then connect to an existing uh, Ceph cluster. So, it's, um, yeah, it's just really nice to quickly bootstrap new instances and then start uh, doing benchmarks. We have uh, a CFC on the gate now for, for the Cinder driver. Uh, we have the pseudometer integration into Rider's Gateway, so it's basically like a polling mechanism where you, um, where, uh, where pseudometer is gonna in, uh, fetch some of the information provided by the Rider's Gateway, and we just provide metrics from that too. Uh, we support Retap to change QoS on the fly. So once again, it's not directly connected to, uh, to Ceph, but since Ceph doesn't support any QoS at all, it's always good to implement the Libre throttling. So now let's say you, you create a new volume type, and then you uh, associate QoS uh, on this. Then if you Retap, then you will change QoS on the fly for that volume, which is um, really useful. Uh, future proofing for new RVD features. Uh, it's something that we do at the code level, and it's uh, just a way to uh, detect uh, new features for uh, new RVDs. Uh, but uh, Josh is going to walk into that for uh, what's what happened into Hammer and what's hap will be happening into the um, next step release uh, about the new RVD features. Uh, we, we fixed uh, a couple of bugs too. Uh, the first one was Nova Evacuate, uh, which, which was kind of critical, critical because um, ma many, many of the operators now re rely on, on Ceph and they all boot instances in, into Ceph. And then if one of your hypervisors goes down, you really want to do Nova Host Evacuate or Nova Evacuate an instance just to rebootstrap that instance uh, on your uh, OpenStack environment. So having this broken was a little bit, uh, a bit, a bit of a problem too. Uh, we fixed some of the Cinder issues uh, while cloning a volume, so creating a volume from a volume, uh, get a clone, but uh, with the wrong size too, so this was fixed. Um, same goes for uh, Nova Instance Resize. Uh, we, uh, while reverting this, uh, we, uh, well, we had a bug, so we uh, had to fix that one too. Uh, the Nova Disk Space reported by the hypervisor itself. Uh, it was something that uh, was introduced into the last release, but um, Nothing was done at the hypervisor level. So basically, when you do something like a Nova hypervisor stat, you get uh, memory available, the discons, and things like this. And in a situation where you use image type connected to Ceph, so you don't really need to uh, read the layout of the, of the base file system of the hypervisor, but you need to go into your Ceph cluster. So that, that, that was still reading the, 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 the file system where uh, Nova was, uh, was living. And uh, yeah, we fixed something on Cinder too when we are create a create a um, create a volume from an image uh, which has uh, new capabilities like uh, kernel, disk, uh, and RAMFS. Uh, our roadmap for Liberty in in Nova. So we <clears throat> we're gonna well, it's something more generic that will be implemented into Nova for detaching volume, but we uh, we might have to do a bit of changes. Uh, into Ceph as well to support that uh, force detach operation. Uh, the use case for that is that uh, you might have instances running on one hypervisor, and then this hypervisor dies, and, but you want to force detach volume because you can maybe reattach that volume to another instance. Uh, we have to fix the cumulative throttling for ephemeral, ephemeral disks. Uh, it's uh, actually something really simple, and it's a patch that uh, has been around for like a release, but uh, didn't get much attention to. 
uh, multi-attach support for RBD. Once again, it's a more generic API thing, uh, but we have to do a couple of modifications on uh, RBD code just to uh, support multi-attach volume. Uh, that's, a, that's a really interesting use case because um, let's say you have, uh, you have an application that can work with just, uh, well, that can access the data on read-only so that the application just doesn't write anything you can simply boot an instance, create a volume, put off your data in it, the application's data, and then you can attach that volume to several instances. So that's, uh, that's really good. Uh, we, we are planning on finishing the Nova snapshot at the RBD level instead of the QMU2. Uh, For Cinder, uh, we, we're gonna support uh, volume migration. So it's uh, basically worked really close, uh, closely with the support, uh, the retype support. So you have a volume type, and then you change the type, and then it's a different backend. So we have several options for this. Uh, either it's from uh, a, Ceph, uh, a single Ceph cluster to a Ceph cluster, um, well, a pool from a pool, uh, from a pool to a pool, and then this can be from one Ceph cluster to another, or this can be from Ceph to anything else, uh, NetApp, whatever. Uh, we <clears throat> we want to be able to import export snapshots uh, or volumes for for RBD2. Um, it's a really interesting use case because uh, people might be using um, uh, virtualization solutions at the moment, just like things like Proxmox, for example, and uh, they want to m maybe move away from Proxmox and just to uh, move to OpenStack. So they already have their volumes ready, so you can simply send the create, and then you will get your own volume registered into the database. You don't, you don't need to do anything really special. And, uh, and the opposite is true as well. If you want to leave OpenStack, you want to wait to get back all of your volumes. We, we have to update also our Cinder backup uh, driver for Ceph uh, because, uh, well, just to be compliant with the uh, differential API, which is kind of unfortunate because we were already doing differential backups. Uh, so basically the Cinder, drive, um, the Cinder backup driver for, for Ceph uh, was clever enough to detect that uh, if it had to do complete backups or uh, differential backup. But now we have to rework that a little bit. Uh, speaking about backups, we also have to implement the differential backups, but uh, orchestrate it. So we can say, okay, let's just take a snapshot of that volume and once a week and get, uh, keep that retention, uh, three volumes in, or something. And of course, we have to implement also the multi-attach at the RBD level. So it's something that closely works with, uh, uh, between Cinder and Nova. So if we do this in Nova, we have to do this in Cinder as well. Uh, a little bit beyond now, we have to support consistency groups in Cinder. Well, it's something that has been around for two releases now in Cinder, and we, uh, well, we haven't done any work on that, basically. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, consistency groups are a way to, to get a consistent, well, consistency groups, but a uh, consistent snapshot for an, a given environment. Uh, let's say you have an N-tier application, and you just want to snapshot everything at the same time, so you get a consistent snapshot of your, of your application at all the different layers. Uh, we want to implement the RBD mirroring, which is a feature that, is, that uh, Josh is currently working on. So it's a Ceph feature. So we want to expose that to OpenStack. Uh, we some, somehow want to uh, integrate with Manila, the distributed file, uh, file system as a service. Uh, by default, the easiest thing we can do is simply map an RBD block device and re-export it with Ceph, uh, with NFS, sorry. Or uh, when CephFS well, would be considered as ready. Uh, we can still use Ganesha in front it's just to provide a SIF and NFS uh, re-exports. Uh, but you also want to see Sage Talks uh, to, to tomorrow. So he's going to be discussing a little bit about uh, that, uh, that subject. So, yeah, so now I'll let this to Josh for us. Yeah, so what's happening in Ceph? Um, there are a number of things happening in, in the land of RBD, especially um, in the, the most recent release of Ceph is, called, is Hammer. And uh, there are a bunch of optimizations merged there. Uh, at the RBD level and the Rados level, um, there are a bunch of hints added so that you can uh, have um, like things like RBD export and import, uh, not use a page cache on the OSD or the local cache on the client side. And also al allocation hints so that uh, tiny writes don't start fragmenting files. Uh, these are now sent with every write RBD does. The uh, uh, allocation hint is passed down um, to, through to the underlying file system on a storage server so that uh, a file on XFS we know is going to be an RBD object, which is going to be 40 megabytes in size, gets if allocated to be 4 megabytes and doesn't get fragmented. So that kind of uh, helps with uh, 
keeping performance consistent and not degrading so much as, it, as the file system ages. On top of these, we also have um, support for a, a bit of read ahead at the RVD level. Uh, this is necessary, especially when you're um, booting a virtual machine, because at that point, um, the kernel isn't, isn't there yet, and to do read ahead into, into a, its, its page cache. So you'll have a, a BIOS or uh, an early uh, bootloader doing lots and lots of tiny sequential IOs. So there's, there's now read ahead in libreadd to uh, facilitate a larger reads there and um, increasing the speed there. This helps in particular when you're using an older guest that uses the IDE bus. Um, we found that booting with, with read ahead enabled with uh, IDE buses actually increases or decreases boot time by something like uh, 50 to 80 percent. For uh, ver um, more more advanced buses, that they they uh, already do larger reads, so the gain is less there, but it's still present. In terms of um, clones, for a long time now we've supported copy and write. In addition, um, some folks from the NUDT University in, in China um, implemented that support for copy and read. This is kind of a more specialized use case than copy and write in general. Um, it's especially useful if you have a, a, an unusual scenario in which you have two different stuff cluster, or one stuff cluster uh, spanning two different sites, and you have uh, a high, high latency between them, and you know that you're going to have um, clones in, in one site that are referencing a parent to another, but you eventually want all the data from the, from the first site to be present in the second. So with copy and read, when, um, whenever a guest does a read of, of an object, um, RBD will go ahead and copy that object entirely from the parent instead of waiting until a write happens. So that's it's kind of an opportunistic copying of all the data, but allowing you to ha use the volume Im immediately. The next two um, really large features in RBD are kind of more groundwork um, and um, enabling RBD to be ready for larger features like RBD mirroring in the future. So the first thing is um, exclusive locking. This is basically to ensure that only one RBD um, client can write to a given image at a, at a time. This is generally enforced by Cinder, but it's really good to have um, guarantees at the at lower layers so you can be sure that your data is safe and that you don't have inconsistencies in um, new, new metadata things that we might be adding to RBD. So one of these things that we've added um, is, is actually keeping track of which objects exist in an RBD image. And this is, we're calling this the object map. This would be like, um, basically a new feature that you would enable when you create an image right now. Um, and it basically it lets, lets you ha have um, much better performance for clones, whereas before you'd have to go ahead and read. Sure. So the object map basically keeps track of which, image, which objects in a, in a given RBD image exist. And this enables lots of optimizations for things like um, exporting and importing an image, um, deleting an image is much faster since we can only need to delete the objects that we know exist. It also um, improves performance in general for reading from clones, since uh, if we don't know which objects exist, we have to go and uh, query them to see which level of, uh, in, a, in the hierarchy of parents and clones an object is, exists at. Whereas with uh, an object map, we actually know exactly where we need to go, so we only have to make one request there. Uh, right now. These exclusive locking and object map features have to be enabled when you create an image, but in Infernalis, um, you can actually enable them on the fly dynamically. And this is something that we probably might end up backporting to a, a later HammerPoint release, since it makes it more e easy to introduce an existing environment. But um, we're waiting for that, for that to kind of stabilize. A number of other things are already um, ready in Infernalis are coming up. One is um, enabling you to specify more. Um, RBD, RBD specific configuration options like the cache size of an image on a per image basis. And this is storing it actually in a stuff cluster so you don't have to mess around with uh, passing things all the way through libvirt to QMU or, or through Nova. It just makes it very simple to um, kind of customize um, individual images or volumes you might have. Uh, kind of a lower level feature is uh, being able to uh, flatten an image normally today. Uh, if you've, you wouldn't flatten an RBD image, if you created snapshots uh, prior to that, these snapshots would still be referencing uh, any parent image, a parent image that they might have. But um, with the support for deep flatten, you actually, um, when you flatten an image, it'll flatten the image as well as all the, all the snapshots of that image. So you don't have to worry about um, delete, deleting snapshots before you can delete clone parents. You can just flatten the, the clones and 
break the dependency entirely. Um, so along with object map, um, in Infernalis, there's another optimization added to that to enable faster um, RBD diffs by keeping track of exactly between which snapshots um, objects changed. And this also allows us to um, report what's, what's actually changed an image between snapshots and what's changed between a parent and a clone much, much more simply. So that's a um, present in a new RBD DU command, which shows you like which, how much disk space has been used by a given snapshot uh, or an image based on the object map. So it's able to be computed very quickly by just looking at the metadata and not actually going and querying the entire image. Uh, one of the kind of biggest features that we're working on is um, RBD mirroring. This is basically uh, asynchronous replication for RBD um, for disaster recovery. So you have one site that's uh, has images uh, that are being, um, whose rights are being mirrored to a second site, uh, keeping the same structure of, of uh, images here and, and here, so that eventually you'll be able to uh, fail over this site. When the site goes down, you can bring up this site and have exactly the same things running on top of it. This is a, kind of a very large project, so we're laying some groundwork here. It, it's possible that it'll be experimentally usable in Infernalis, but it likely won't be fully usable until Joule. Um, these are just the kind of RBD level features. Um, you can find other talks uh, um, about the generic stuff features that are also happening as we speak. So Bastion, oh, now we want to talk a little bit about um, how to best configure OpenStack to take advantage of stuff. So one of the things that we've recommended for a long time now is enabling um, RBD caching. This is an in-memory cache on the client side which basically allows you to absorb little bursts of, write, of writes. Um, in write-back write -back mode, this means that it, it will um, tell the guest that it's completed the write once it's written to the cache, but it will still reflect flushes. So it behaves like a well-behaved um, well disk cache. The second option here, RPD cache write through until flush, uh, make sure it's extra safe. So it, it stays in write through mode until it actually sees a flush from the guest. Because some guests don't send flushes or cumulative is misconfigured, and in that case, it wouldn't be safe to actually do write back caching. So th those two settings are the defaults in Hammer, but if you're using an earlier version of stuff, you probably want to enable that on your hypervisor. Um, I think since uh, Firefly now, I really have supported um, a parallelization of different kinds of management operations, like deleting images. If you want that to go faster, you can increase that from the default of 10 operations to 20. Um, the next option the, is called an admin socket. This is something that you'll, you'll see commonly in Ceph daemons, where you can go and introspect what their state is and uh, see what's going on with them. It can also be useful on, on hypervisor side to, exam to see um, what, what a RBD, given RBD volume is doing, um, how many ops it's doing, also for debugging. Um, you can see which requests are currently in flight, uh, where they're, what they're waiting for, if they're stuck, what's happening. And also for verifying configuration, you can go and dynamically set configuration to this admin socket, and you can also see, and this list it out and see if your configuration is, is actually being applied as you expect it is. Related to that, you can of course set a log file um, so that you can enable the debugging there and see what's going on with your RBD volumes there. Um, in terms of glance, um, so for a RBD, um, most, of, most of the time, to get the most use out of it, you want to use raw images and expose those, um, the location of, those, of, those, of the backend there um, via the Glance's API. And that's the show image, image direct URL. That lets Glance expose the, the backend location so that Nova and Cinder can create copy and write clones of those images. And um, if you are using these, uh, the copy and write clone feature, you probably don't want Glance to do any local caching since it's not actually transferring data anyway. So you can just disable that in, in the uh, glancesapi.conf. It's getting rid of the cache management part of the flavor. So as I mentioned, uh, to get, take advantage of copy and write cloning with stuff, you want to use raw, raw images. Um, currently, you have to convert them um, before you're uploading them. But in Kilo, there's basic support for actually doing this conversion in Glance itself. These are some commands here you can use to convert them yourself if you are just downloading 2K2 images and want to make sure they're raw. 
if you already have them in RBD, you can convert them directly there and then tell Glance about their location. But Glance, you do want to uh, create a snapshot of that image and protect it so that it can be used for cloning before you tell Glance about it. Um, one of the kind of lesser used features of Glance is uh, metadata that you can associate with an image. With this metadata, you can kind of tell um, Nova properties about how this image should be used. You can, for example, specify the um, disk bus to use. So if you're using modern Linux guests, um, you really want to be using the Verdeo SCSI bus. This is, is generally higher performing than the existing like Verdeo block uh, bus. And it also allows uh, discard support if you want to enable that separately. So in, in, on, on the Nova side, um, there are a number of different options you probably want to set. The first here listed here uh, for, is for enabling discard support. This is like trim for an SSD. So you can, ha um, since RBD devices are thin provisioned, you can reclaim space from them by running an FS trim inside of a virtual machine. But in order for that to work, um, Cumio has to know about, know that RBD supports that and actually expose that uh, through to the guest. This can kind of ha um, have um, that some bad effects on performance if you're not careful. So it's a, it probably a good idea to you, when you, if you enable this to be aware of that and probably throttle the I.O. via Cumulus I.O. throttling. And um, one of the uh, other reasons people use, like using RBD for Nova in particular is that you can, it enables live migration. Um, but since it is shared storage, uh, Nova can't directly inject things into it very easily. So just disabling all the a password injection, key injection, or partition injection is generally a, a good idea. Um, you, can get, you can put those things into RBD through the, um, Nova's metadata service or through config drive. There are patches outstanding to actually enable um, config drive to be stored on RBD as well. And finally, there's a bunch of live migration flags. Um, I can't go through and then kind of explain all the, what, all, what all these do, but these, these are basically the ones that you want to use uh, to enable live migration to work with shared storage like RBD. Oh, I, I may skip the disk cache mode. So in order to take advantage of the RBD um, local client cache, uh, Kimu has to be aware of it so that it does send flushes through and it is safe. And so uh, enabling that is just a configuration option in Nova where you can say that for our network block devices like RBD, we want to enable a cache in right back mode. Okay, so this is <clears throat> this is a really interesting use case where um, people often have a different set of hypervisors where they, um, at some point, you, you want to build like a high performance hypervisors uh, with local SSDs, for example, and then you want to use image type default. So basically, when you boot an instance, it's just a file on the file system. Or you could use LVM properly to, to get better performance. But um, something interesting is that you might also have uh, well, less, not less important, but less critical in terms of performance virtual machines uh, that are running on Ceph. So something interesting to do in that case is just to build uh, zone aggregates and where you put all of your SSDs hypervisors and all of your hypervisors that are connected to Ceph uh, into different entities. And then you, you just expose both of them through availability zones that you pin into a sort of type of flavor. So while booting an instance, you will uh, either get an instance uh, that will have a local disk, a super fast local uh, SSD, or uh, that's going to be on, on, on Ceph. Um, at, this, at the signal level, there is not much, not much to, to configure, uh, except all of the flags that are currently available. Uh, it, but these are just uh, simple configuration flags. Where is my Ceph cluster? Which uh, user? Which key should I use? So we, we don't need to put that here. Uh, the only thing to remember is that you, you must use a Glance, Glance API too, um, because when you're doing a, create a, a boot from volume, so create an image from, uh, create an image from a volume, create a volume from an image too, uh, you, you want to enable this. Uh, something that you want to do as well, and as mentioned earlier, Ceph doesn't really support QoS at the moment, so you really want to make heavy use of uh, QMU throttling. So you really want to create types, volume types, where you associate Q, uh, QoS uh, specifications, and then you put all of your instances, like uh, you create all of your volumes and you attach them to, uh, to your instances. And this also works with uh, boot from volume, of course. 
Uh, a little bit about Sydney backup. So uh, there were talk yesterday from from Neil about uh, about backups and disaster recovery in general. So that that has been mostly covered already. But uh, I just wanted to highlight that uh, once again too. Um, the, the current state of the implementation of Sydney backup uh, states that the only valid use case uh, currently is when you have a single OpenStack environment and two CEF clusters. So you have your you're, you're just an active OpenStack environment with a local Ceph cluster, and then you have another Ceph cluster on another location where you can simply cre uh, create volumes, then create backups, and then you can restore backups. Uh, the, um, the, the, the only issue with that is uh, with uh, the two properties that were introduced in the last cycle, uh, which are uh, Cinder import and export metadata. Uh, it, it basically allows you to get off the uh, for database fields uh, and re-import volume properties into another uh, OpenStack environment. So ideally what you would like to do is to have two OpenStack environments uh, and then you regularly text uh, uh, sort of backups and then export all the metadata from a, a given volume backup. And then you, you want to re-import that into another OpenStack environment just to properly do your DR. But that's something that just doesn't work at the moment. So uh, we are currently working on things, fixing that too. It's not much to do, but it's just for you to know it's something that can't be achieved at the moment. Uh, one last point about guests and configuration. Uh, we, um, we highly recommend to always install the Cumul Guest Agent because it provides many capabilities. And what we really want to use in that case is uh, the Libvirt FS, FS Freeze and FS Thaw, uh, API, where you can um, just perform an FS Freeze while performing a snapshot. So you can ensure that at least you get a consistent snapshot. But you can you can do it, you can do this uh, also with uh, with hooks uh, that are implemented. So. Uh, you, create, you, you, you just click on create a snapshot. Uh, the Cumul Guest Agent receives that goal. It just uh, freezes the file system, or no, before, before that, it executes the hook. So it can be do a dump of the database, something like this. Then stop the application, freeze the file system. Once it's done, you just revert that. So you restart again the application, and you're good. So you can ensure that a certain, um, at a certain point in time, you, you, you have a consistent backup. And you have, been, uh, you have been doing this all the way through all the layers, so, so from the application itself to the block device too. So that's why it's so important to, to properly configure this. Uh, this works with the glance metadata always require a quants. And uh, so you just put that on your image, and uh, this will get configured while you will uh, be performing a snapshot if the Cumulgast agent is installed. Um, Josh and I have been putting a lot of efforts on documenting all of this. Uh, obviously, some of the bits that we uh, discussed during that talk uh, are not yet present on that document too, but we will uh, be pushing uh, this uh, pretty soon. So don't hesitate to test, contribute, and because uh, well, this is uh, the community-based reference for configuring uh, OpenStack environments. So well, we would like to thank you all, all for your kind attention, and I guess we'll be happy to uh, to take some uh, some questions now. Uh, yeah, we should have uh, seven minutes or something. So if you if you have any questions, you please uh, go to the mic and uh, ask your question. Hi, I have a question about the flattening process. Well, I've got closer the to the mic, please. Is, can you? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've got a question about the flattening process. When you have co use copy and write, and then your image got apparent, uh, is there any issue? Any good practices to use it? Is it safe? I flattening, mean, RBD flatten option. Oh, fl flattening. Fl yeah, so flattening is generally safe. Um, the issue, the only difficulty right now is that if you have created snapshots the sna um, of an image before flattening it, the snapshots will still refer to the parent, and so you can't delete the parent until the snapshots are deleted right now. So if with, with Infernalis, with deep flatten, you'll be able to flatten an image and all the snapshots at once. <laughs> so you'll, you'll be able to break the dependency entirely without deleting snapshots. Uh, what about the performance of the, let's say, if I create many, many uh, clones for one base image and I want to flatten them one by one, for example, do the, do the other customers will notice that I'm flattening something? I mean, the base image will decrease the performance? Yeah, so the, um, in general, the base image will increase in performance because it won't have to do the um, the, copy, the copy and write anymore. So any new any objects that were, weren't written before will be there. Um, but 
uh, it is a heavy duty operation where it's you know reading from the entire th the entire previous image and copying all that data. So if you um, if you want to be careful about running that, if you're ha doing a hundred of them at once, you might want to throttle that and make sure it's only doing, a, for example, a, a certain number of IOs at a time. And another question: uh, What about cache tiering? Any news? Uh, so cache tiering uh, is definitely getting there. Um, I think it's, it's making lots of improvements in terms of how I.O. can happen there. Um, I think it's not, not quite sure that it's entirely ready yet still in Hammer, but more work is being done to make it more usable. Okay, thanks. Hey, guys. Thanks for the talk. It's always good to hear what's coming down the, the tubes. Um, just curious, uh, Ceph is an obvious example of this, but there are other block storage solutions where you could have uh, multiple instances of Cinder potentially fronting a, a block storage solution which could do multi site or, you know, <coughs> or uh, multi cloud anyway. Um, would the Cinder export and Cinder import uh, metadata capabilities you were talking about, which aren't there yet, but assuming they were there? Well, they are, but. Uh, do they work? I thought the idea was that they weren't working. Uh, they, well, well, they do work, but uh, the, the main issue is when you import the metadata into another OpenStack environment. Uh, mm -hmm. This is what the bug is. But you can safely export everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, once you import it, there are some missing fields. Uh, right. So if I wanted to manage the process of handing off uh, some sub some block storage from one OpenStack instance to another, mm -hmm. would the export with an import with some idea of, you know, flicking an enable or disable bit in that process be the appropriate way to do that? And if so, is that something you think about maybe federating <coughs> between Cinder implementations? Yeah, so in so general, I think um, today the, the easiest way to do that is with like the Cinder backup service and with these uh, export and um, import metadata APIs. Mm -hmm. um, and you really want to look at Neil's talk that he gave yesterday on dude, where's my volume? He went over a bunch of different scenarios where that, and how to do that um, with it and what's, what, what would be the best way to do that in the future. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. So I wonder about the live migration flags. You've, saw, uh, you've uh, presented the flags you use uh, to enable live migration with set buckets. Uh, I wonder why do you are disabling the tunnel migration there? Because uh, by default it's on and uh, you were uh, not presenting this flag. What is on, sorry? The tunnel migration flag. It's on by default. Okay. Uh, but uh, in your setup, uh, you've uh, disabled it. Is, it uh, the, is there a reason for that? Or? Don't have any. Turn off migration flag. Turning off migration flags. You've presented some of the uh, live migration flags. There weren't a yeah. tunnel flag. There's some. So one, one flag is missing, that's what you're saying? Yes, and I wonder why. Is, okay. is it, uh, what, what flag is it and what, what, what does uh, it do? View migrate tunnel. And what does it do? Uh, makes the migration go from, uh, from chemo to libvirt process, then through the network to another libvirt process, and then to another chemo. So if you disable it, uh, chemo um, talks to each other directly. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I think there's no real reason to <laughs> say what right now. I think it's just a newer option that we haven't considered yet. Hi. Hi. So I have a question about uh, object encryption. Do you support uh, object encryption as of now? So object encryption. Um, so right now, Ceph supports um, at rest encryption using dmcrypt on the underlying storage devices. Um, in the future, we might want to actually do that uh, at a higher level and, and, and support it on the wire encryption as well. But right now, it's not there. So but we're looking at doing that in the future. That? Do you have a roadmap that one? The down the line of here or something? Um, I'm not exactly sure where it is on the roadmap. Okay, fine. Thank you. I have one more question. The Silometer self integration, right, is a, currently using the polling, but it is not scalable for larger clusters, like 50,000, something like that. Is there is a plan for changing those things? Not as far as I know. Yeah, in terms of Silometer, um, the Radius Gateway, I think, right now does not have any kind of um, notification API. But you can kind of relies on things um, looking at its logs. Potentially, we c you could have some kind of integration using um, using Librados and actually using its watch notify primitives to do that kind of thing. Uh, although I'm not aware of anyone pl planning to do that right now. Okay. Fine. Yeah, but the main issue with that is that you have to re-implement all the logic. So if you do directly with this with uh, uh, at the Librados yeah. level, right. then you have to do way more work than just 
getting what uh, Lee uh, Rudders so Gateway is uh, exposed to you. So Currently, polling is okay for a few nodes, but if you go for larger setup, yeah. mm. it will be okay.